this is um, the next board I am going to look into and it came to me in this original RF wrapping and this is the European version of that it was just cardboard and this machine has actually been worked on by someone else you do have a double socket situation here on the PLA you have um, an empty seed socket and you have the kernel room and uh, basic room is uh, is not populated neither is the VIC-2 ship and none of the other ships here are socketed so we do have some work to do on this but we will start the fault finding process first we must populate the board with the missing ships and here i have taken the ships from the last board we repaired the number one in the series and they have taken the peculiar approach and putting another socket on top of the old socket on the PLA chip and that's probably because they've done some fault finding and it's easier to take ships in and out of these uh, socket with the round uh, holes and it's also a good sign that they have done some fault finding on this board and not getting this finished and as we see we do have another black screen uh, on our hand not very surprised about that since they have done some fault finding on the PLA. But black screen means that the first uh, shot we take at this is the um, dead test cartridge. I should have done some more measuring of data lanes and address lines. But let's take the ordinary approach and do the dead test cartridge and do what the dead cartridge find out before we do anything else. But of course, the dead test cartridge is known to make mistakes from time to time. The dead test cartridge gives us one steady blink. That means that the first detected failure on the ramship is the first ship on the list. Of course, there could be other faults in control signals or other ways on the data bus that also gives us the same result. I take a quick measurement of the temperature of the ships to see if anything sticks out and this Fluke temperature probe is a quick way to test that. Nothing really gets warm, but I do notice that we have actually four different Moose Logic chips here. And that's the 74257s that we had issues with last time that gave us a black screen. And since the dead test cartridge now is giving us blinks on the screen, I do think that we will take the approach of the memory ship first and see what we find out. As far as I can see this blinking, uh, it indicates that this is a flash for the first memory position. And even though this can be a bit confusing for the flash codes and the revisions and so on, and I do think that we will take this as a revision BC64 and the first row on the, um, the flash codes and then it states that U12 is the one to change first when you have this flash and we might have to do some more later because the flash codes only indicates the first drum ship where there are faults if there are succeeding faults we have to take one at a time yes since here we see what we have to deal with there has clearly been someone in here before we knew about this socket here that was changed and this here is clearly changed and this bunch wire looks kind of bodgy to me what more do we have we actually see no solder on the 6526 and they was actually of mixed heritage it was different model numbers and also on the memory chips we had at least two different brands and they have not been changed it seems those four are Motorola and this one is Motorola and these three here are a neck and they also have different speed ratings the Motorola's are 150 nanoseconds while the neck ships are 200 nanoseconds that doesn't matter much but at least that's what it is And 
as always when I desolder a ship, I try to keep the ship intact so that I can test the ship afterwards to check if it actually was bad or not. Then it's just a quick bit of uh, cleanup with uh, desoldering wick and then it's uh, placing in a new socket and soldering that in place. And this is ordinary double swipe socket, nothing out of the ordinary. Yes, was this a wild goose chase or not? We have to test the ship to uh, see. And the test completes in four passes and we actually see that the ship is fully working. So it probably will just blink at us again with the dead test or give us a black screen uh, when we test again. And we still have a black screen. So nothing changed uh, there and we will also try again with um, the dead test cartridge to see if the symptom still is the same on that one. It still blinks to us and it has the same blinking pattern as it had before. And that means that the fault is not with the memory chip if it's not something to do with the address lines or something that gives this as a false error. Maybe it's a control line or something. So what went wrong? The dead test cartridge said that we should have a fault at uh, location 1 and that one data bit at least was uh, faulty from the RAM chips. But it stated here that the dead test diagnostic cartridge is designed to test the C64 and C128 in 64 mode in systems that fail to display video information on power up. And I have found this to be a very unreliable tool. But it is clearly stated here uh, that the dead test is almost completely dedicated to system ROM testing and does no type of system ROM or port testing. But of course it depends on the address and data bus to be operating from the other ships. And it's also clearly stated here that if all RAM ECS can be accessed and the data bus seems to be operating, the diagnostic screen should be displayed. But of course, when we have the blinking screen, it does not go further than that. So it stops on another fault. And when the diagnostic cartridges does not do uh, us any good, we have to go further. And this is the normal way. I, I normally start this way when I have a C64. I probe around for some signals. If it's a black screen, I probe that I have video signal. And I probe the address and the data bus to look for stuck lines or lines that display an erratic behavior where you have some levels that not high or low or some other device that fighting uh, to control the bus. But here you can see what I found when I actually did the test on the address lines. Address lines uh, on the bus uh, is here B0 to B15 and they are giving very clear and, and readable result on every line except b8 b9 b12 b13 b14 and b15 and these lines are all stuck high and in ttl logic a high can mean that it's a floating bus but it can also mean that some other device is pulling the bus high and I'm not sure what the fault is here, but the normal way of troubleshooting this is to disconnect all the devices from the address bus to see which device uh, clogs up the bus. But on the C64 in the schematic, you can clearly see that the ships that's uh, using the uppermost address lines is the CPU that actually controls this. It's the memory ships uh, we are the 74 ls 257s and it's the pla that has the four uppermost lines and it's also the vic 2 ship that has these lines and the rest of the lines is divided so that some of the systems use only uh, yeah four of the lines like the caa ships and you have the um, video memory that uses 10 lines and you have the um, 
ROM chips that using either 12 or 11 lines depending on the size of the EEPROM. So the kernel and the basic uses 12 lines while the character rooms only uses 11 lines. So that's the main devices that's directly connected to the address bus. There are some other devices that do handle some signals on the bus, like the uh, 74 LS258, the uh, 373 and the 139. So we will start with uh, looking into the direct uh, yeah, ships that's connected to the bus, and we actually start with the offenders from last time, the 74257s, that on this board also is most ships that's known to fail from time to time. And that's what we do with the address bus. And the data bus actually looks just fine. And this is probed with the dead test cartridge in, and it's also probed with the regular test cartridge. And they, they look the same. And this is measured both on the CPU and it's also measured directly on the data bit on each memory chip. The signals is a bit different because of noise levels, but otherwise they are the same. And all the data lines seems to be working just fine. And I don't think the, the problem lies within there. So now let's get on with the rest of uh, the process. The next step I take on this is actually to desolder the 74-257 ships. They can of course um, be the, the reason for uh, the fault that we are seeing here, but they are also kind of a key factor to um, demultiplexing and multiplexing the address lines. So to have them away, it's much easier to check the address line connections on the rest of the board. So that's probably a good idea to socket them at once anyway. The Hawk Air helps me to uh, take out the ships without uh, lifting any traces. And I actually have a pretty good success rate with this approach. And the only track I have lifted was on the last board. And I do think that that was lifted before I started uh, to work on this. So here the tracks are clean and we are ready to uh, solder in the new sockets here. But first let's test the 74257s to see if they actually work and if they was the cause of uh, our failure. And for that we used the Mini 2 programmer and we just do the logic uh, test on this. And first we try auto find that normally is a full test. But if you want to also want to test it through the truth table of the chip, you can actually do this with a manual test to see if it reads OK. And this test is not totally foolproof because there still could be something wrong with both the inputs and output with levels and such. If it's faulty, it is faulty. But it's if it tests OK, you really should do a second guess on that. And as both of these ships are um, in order, we continue to look at the devices that could affect somehow on the address bus. And we have to remember, since not every address line is affected, but it's the A8, A9, A12, A13, A14 and A15. So it's the uppermost one and it's A8 and A9. And then A10 and A11 is OK. And that means that it's not every ship that can affect this if this is a bus loading failure. The CPU, the VIC-2 ship and the PLA ship is the main culprits here. And that's the main reason why we socket the CPU next. As a quick test I just start with another 6510 CPU installed. It's the same black screen. Yeah, I am again probing the address lines uh, and also the data lines on the uh, 6510 CPU. And I even try with another uh, CPU to check if the CPU is draining so much power or shorting the lines to, uh, to ground. But there is really no difference. All is the same as it was at the beginning. As the next step, I decided to uh, desolder the um, U15, that is a 74LS139 chip. And this does some of the address decoding for a chip enable for 
the color ram and the vic2 ship so this might be a culprit it's also connected to address line a8 and a9 that we actually have problems with so if this input is affecting the bus this might be our culprit And we do a quick test and it actually goes through without faults in our um, tester. The next ship we target is the U14, it's a 74 LS258 ship. And this ship stands in between the memory decoding of the VIC-2 ship and the address lines. And this is actually cascaded behind the 74 LS257 and uses address line A15, A7 and A14 and A6 as direct inputs. The output enable of this ship is actually controlled by the AAC signal that comes from the VIC-2 ship. And this ship is also a MUS original, so we are naturally suspicious of those. And we also test the 74LS258 chip, and it tests OK that one too, so another wild goose chase. At this point I also decided to desolder the character room, as the other two room ships was desoldered and put in sockets already. The character room does have one address line less than the other two, it's connected to A0 to A11. But at this point I really suspected that it was not the address bus at all, but to rule out all other possibilities I decided to desolder all ships that was directly connected to the address bus. Yeah, I decided to take a quick scope probing on the address line with the room ships out to see if there was any difference at all on the um, levels on the address uh, bus but it was the same A8, A9, A12, 13, 14 and 15 lay low all the others seems to work okay yeah the U6 the color ram also has to go at least it is connected to A8 and A9, so it might cause some uh, problems down the line, but at this point I'm only looking for differences to, to learn more about how the address system on the C64 works. This time I don't have any tester that could test the 2114 color memory, so I will test it later on in my 60 clone. But first I'm just probing the address bus to look for differences, and as suspected, there was none. Could the U26, the 74 LS373, do anything to trouble up the address bus? Yes, it could, because this ship stands to do the address ROS decoding when the WIC ship takes control over the RAM ships to do memory refresh. And this is done by the output enable of the AEC signal together with the ROS uh, signal that uh, does the tree stating of uh, this ship. So it could cause some havoc, but I really do doubt it that this is the reason, but anyway it is connected to the address bus, so I will desolder it and measure the bus without it. Just as extra precaution we test the 74 LS373 ship 2 and it works okay. But this is a type of chip I actually had tested okay before and had some fault on so we might change this anyway if we can't find the fault elsewhere. At this point I do know that the fault is not with the address bus itself. It do has 
to be one of the control signals and the control logic that controls these signals that causes this or maybe there is a fault on the PCB. But anyhow, I am desoldering all the memory chips to test them individually and make 100% sure that they are not the cause of this. So we are now ending up with another completely socketed C64 board. And it's a shameful way of doing 64 repairs really, but as a start and to getting to know the internals of the C64, it actually... Yeah, it's a valuable uh, lesson to see how each chip behaves individually. The testing takes uh, a bit of a time because it runs through each chip uh, four times. And each of the passes is stressing the ship, of course, but you really should have a way to just run a one pass test if you have chips that you probably know working and you just want to do a simple test. Yeah, and all the 4164 memory chips run through the test just fine. So we are not just starting to um, put sockets in the board and we also will test the rest of the logic chip that we have desoldered. Yeah, the 74258 is the first chip to be tested and that tests just fine. And the next chip we are going to test is the 4066 chip and this is the one that stands in between the four lowermost data lines into the VIC-2 chip and it also tests fine. Yeah, I do a quick probe after I've placed all the chips back in the sockets and just mainly to make sure that we have not destroyed anything else. And then it's one thing left to do, and that's just desolder the 6526 chips. That we should have done from the start anyway. I have used for them further on in this project as test candidates. And they need to be tested them too at some point. Yeah, I do a quick uh, reprobe of the video signal output from the VIC-2 chip to check that the VIC-2 chip is doing its job and it's displaying um, a good strong video signal, it's just that everything is black. And just a quick uh, re-measurement of the uh, voltages to check that we have the internal 5V, the external 5V and the uh, internal 12V for uh, the VIC-2 chip and the SID. And we do have a good strong signal, it's uh, almost exactly 5 volts on the uh, external one that comes from the power supply. Yeah, and then it's just a quick soldering of the sockets for the 6526 chips before we can start with measuring out the control signals. Because now we have covered everything else, so it's just the control signals left and... I know that I have missed something in that, or that I haven't done a good enough job with measuring out the control signals. To understand the different um, control signals that there are in the C64, we have to look into the schematics a bit. And the control of the data bus and address bus on the Commodore 64 is actually dealt between two main components and in most cases the 6510 cpu is is not the boss in this relationship the vic2 ship generates the clocks the color clock the dot clock and the system clock that everything runs by and in addition to that it also makes and controls the aec signal that really decides who is the master on the bus and who gets to put out addresses and who gets to, to write to the bus. And everything that is connected to these buses on the C64 has some way of disconnecting themselves from the bus. And here on the 6526 you have the read-write that connected to the read-write signal to see if you should read, read or write to the data bus. And you have the ship select signal. And the ship select signal really decides if this ship should control the bus or that it should tree state the bus. If it's tree stating the data bus, 
it's as it's not connected at all. And both the 6526s is connected the same. And in our case, it's just a data and address bus that is of interest when it comes to tree stating things. And this is a very old version of the schematic, but I think this gives a very good overview when you are looking into things and explaining things. Amongst other things, you have the small waves when a line is crossing another line without making connection to it. Because some of the older scans, is, it's a bit vary on the eye because it's difficult to see what's what some of the time. And this is the other part of uh, the schematic where the VIC and the memory and the room ships are connected. And the memory decoding here is done by the ROS cost scheme, that's the norm on dynamic uh, RAM. But in addition to that, you have the address lines that controls the internal registers of the VIC 2 ship. The VIC-2 ship has the clock circuits. Everything that gives a clock in this computer is generated by the VIC-2 ship. And the VIC-2 ship has its own ship select that comes by this address decoding. And it also controls the color RAM down here with the data lanes that's switched in by this 4066. And the EPROMs they have the chip select signal generated by the PLA where you have the basic kernel and character room where each of those decide what should be on the bus. The memory chips almost has the same kind of scheme but they have the read-write signal here and the read-write signal is to see if the memory chip should be written to or it should be read from. And this signal is the one here. And as stated earlier, the AEC signal is really the boss of if it's the VIC chip or the 6510 that controls reading and writing. And that signal is the trigger for these two guys up here. The 6510 chip is really controlled by the CAEC signal that's combined with the DMA memory request signal. But the main signals we have to watch out for and look at here is the ASC signal, it's the read-write signal, and it's the clock signals that goes into the 6510 CPU. And it's always the first thing I measure is the, the pin 39 dot clock signal, the phase one clock. It's the first thing I look into, and the next thing I look into is the AEC signal. And if those are present on the 6510, something is running on the bus. And of course, another important control signal is the reset signal. And the reset signal is normally held low until the system has stabilized the clock and so on. With every chip in except uh, the 6526, we are going to probe for the control signals. And here you can see the read-write signal, how it looks. It looks as it's uh, high, and the high usually means the read, because I do think that this is a um, read with an inverted uh, write uh, normally. And then we probe the room ships. First, uh, the character room. It's uh, flatlining on high, that means this ship is not selected. And we also measure the basic room. Sorry, the picture disappeared, but... It's also flatline on high and not selected. And of course there is no activity when there is no basic action. But the kernel, it's switching in and out. And that's how it should be. Because it's running all the internal routines when the C64 is running. And then we measure the read-write signal on the PLA ship. And this is also flatlining and it's flatlining high. And we also move, measure the um, read-write signal on the RAM chip, and this is also flatlining. Yeah, the read-write signal on the 6526 is also about the same as on the memory chips.
Yeah, I tried to film this when I uh, measured the um, CPU clock and the AC signal, but the footage just wasn't good enough. And I measured here the dot two clock on the CPU, and I really only measure this clock. If it's, this clock is not present, it's probably something fault either with the CPU or the VIC-2 chip. Because this clock is based on the uh, zero clock that comes from the VIC-2 chip. So I take the lazy approach and measure this first. And if this is present, the CPU is uh, ticking. But one of the most important control signal is the AEC signal that times if the VIC-2 chip or the CPU is using the buses. And this is a signal that is present on a lot of the chips, and I just measured it now on the CPU. And you can measure this with a scope, and for your convenience I've made this short table here. And this shows you where the different signals are on the different chips. And if the signal is missing on one of these, you have a break in the PCB somewhere. But this signal does have three forms. It's the clean AEC signal that's present on this, and it's the C AEC signal that is combined with the DMA that goes to the CPU, and you have the inverted AAC that goes to the 74257s and comes out of the 7406 chip. And on some boards, it's not pin 10 that has the input for this on the, the color clock it's uh, pin 12. So if you don't find this on pin 10, try pin 12 and vice versa. So this is the short version and this measured totally okay on our board. I did not measure the AEC clock on all of these, but I did follow it around the board and it was present. So I don't think the fault is there. I actually do know, have a good clue over what the fault is, and it did escape me on the last scene where I measured the signal. I will show you this just straight away. Sorry for the bad audio quality in the last uh, clip. The bodge wire I'm uh, fastening here now to the 6526 socket is the key to what we are going to test next. I just connect now my uh, video uh, grabber for uh, the composite video signal and we will give this a test. Yeah, and I also unplug the dead test cartridge. I don't think it will be needed for this test. Yeah, and I will just hold the budge wire onto the right pin on the CPU, and I think we will get the picture. Yes, and we do. And as you can see, there is no blinking cursor, because we have not plugged in the 6526 sockets. Oops, and it's not easy to hold this in place. Yeah, and I think I will try to explain what uh, just happened here. I'm going to explain to you the mistake I did when I measured on the read write signal that we just saw in this uh, in this video and I did not study the schematics good enough so when I saw that the signal was high here on the, the CPU and I did notice that the signal was low on the memory chips, but what I didn't realize was the, that there was no inverter involved in this. And the main reason why I did this mistake is actually this uh, Moose 6510 reproduction uh, picture that I have here. As you can see on pin 38 on the, the screen here, there is no inverted line over the right. And that, of course, what it should be. So when the CPU wants to write something on the bus, puts this line low. And on the memory chip, of course, the write line is inverted. So in my mind, when I thought about this, I thought there one must be an inverter somewhere on the line. But that is not the case, as we will see. There is some mismatch between the read-write signal that I measured on the CPU and what I measured on the memory chips. And we will take a look into the schematics to see how this all fits together. 
This is a very old version of the Commodore 64 schematics and it's a version I found online some time ago that is a scan probably from the original either it's the um, reference guide or it's some old service booklet I, I'm not sure but this is a, a different layout than we are normally used to but the printing is much clearer on this one and there is less handwritten stuff I have heard some claims that this is not totally accurate but I have found some mistakes in all the C64 schematics uh, that I've studied, not including the latest board revision, of course, because I have never studied those in detail. But as we see here on the schematics, I have marked the read-write signal with a red line, and on this part of the schematics, the read-write line is connected to the CPU, 6510, pin 39, and it goes to pin 34, on the no 22 on the 6526 uh, on both of them and then it leaves this uh, schematic here uh, on this read write uh, bus line and we will continue this on the next page where we see that we have the input read write into the schematics here it goes to the cartridge port and it also goes to the pla and it goes from the PLA, it goes up to the write enable on the memory chips, the pin 15. And it also goes straight away beneath all the um, EPROMs that is always read only anyway, and straight over to the um, VIC chip. And you can also see that there is a read write line on the SID chip, but that's not connected to this one, it's directly controlled by pin 11 on the VIC 2 chip. So this is how the read-write line should be connected and as you can see there is no electronics in here that can shift the level on this signal, it should only be bare copper between all these pins. When I looked uh, into the, the board, what I just did now, I did measure this on the 6526 and find the same signal as I did on the memory chips. And I also did probe this on the VIC-2 chip and the PLA. I showed the PLA, I didn't show the um, VIC-2 chip. And afterwards I also probed the cartridge port, but I didn't do that up front. But what I found was that all these chips that's marked with the red spot did not have the connection in place. So what I just did, I just took a bodge wire from pin 22 on the 6526 and connected it to the read-write pin up on the, the CPU. And you, as you saw, there was an immediate picture when we turned this on with this bodge in place. So that's obviously our fault, and that means that there is a fault on the PCB in this area. So I do suspect that this is something that happened when these sockets here was placed on the board and the old chips was desoldered. I do not bother to take out these sockets to look into that further, so I'm going to make a bodge wire from here to here. Even though if this suddenly makes contact again, it doesn't matter at all. So I will just make a bodge from here someplace and... Yeah, probably this signal goes to a VIA or something. I think I actually saw that this signal goes from here. So it's it's probably over here somewhere that the, the break is. So that actually was our fault on uh, this machine, but I do still have one thing uh, left to test. And when we booted this machine now and saw the screen, I actually had two ICs that I swapped for new ones, and that is the 74LS258 and the 74LS373. So I'm going to put in the original ships here to see if they work on the board. They both tested okay in the um, Mini Pro programmer. But we are going to test them anyway to keep as much as we can of the original ships on this board. Yeah, we just uh, pull the uh, replacement 74 258 out of the board and replace it with the original MOS ship that uh, was in here before. And this is the screen recording of the test done without the dead test cartridge in uh, the computer. 
and this does not look good and we have to test this uh, ship again in the mini pro programmer to see if this if this really is a fully functional ship because this looks very suspicious but as you can see the mini pro programmer reports everything okay so this is one of the cases where the mini pro programmer testing comes to a dead end for our part but now it's time to do some final testing of the board, so we do place the 74 ships back in place, we place the uh, 65, uh, 26 ships back in place, and we solder a temporary bodge wire, and we do run the diagnostic harness to see if everything else is okay. Yeah, and the test just start up fine, and we are running this on a high speed, so we don't have to wait so long. And here comes, of course, an uh, error. And as you can see, it says control port, and it's the 4066 chip and this is not the 4066 chip that we talked about earlier this is another 4066 that sits between the control lines of the CIA to make some of the lines uh, shared we are back at our um, original old schematics again and here we can see the 4066 here up in the top and the inputs of this is connected to the pot a y and pot a x lines that goes from both joystick ports and these are actually multiplexed with this 4066 because these lines pot x and pot e they goes to the sid chip but you can see here that the control logic that controls the columns on the keyboard tells the system which of the joystick ports is present at a given time on these uh, pot X and pot Y. So they actually multiplex this to give the possibility to have paddles or analog inputs on both joystick ports and combine this to one input on the SID chip and this is read sequentially. So the, the 6526 chip knows when each of the ports is listened to and that's why this mistake on this fault can be both regarding the 6526 U1 or the 4066 and this is actually tested by the keyboard dongle that seems that this signal is okay but the signals read by the SID chip is not okay and I have seen this fault with other faults and then it's been PCB faults in this pot X and pot Y signals and on the um, 6581 SID you can see that these lines is coming in here, pot X and pot Y. So they have the entry point into the schematics here. So that's what we are doing. going to do now. We are going to change this chip and we are going to take a new test with the test harness and see that the system actually is working. This is not the last chip that's not socketed on this board, but we are getting close. There is one 7474 in the clock circuit around the VIC-2 chip and it's the 556 timer circuit that's not socketed uh, as of yet when we're finished with this chip. Yes, and then we are running one final uh, test after we have soldered in the socket for the new 4066 and placed the new 4066 in the, the socket. As you can see, it works just perfect. Yeah, and now I just measure out where the closest path for the bodge wire is, and that the connections to the memory chips and everything else is OK. And then I will just solder in a, a permanent bodge wire that will solve the problems once and for all. Yeah, and this bodge wire might be a bit on the thick side, but I actually don't have any thinner wire at the moment. My 
old wire wrapping uh, cable is actually starting to dissolve on the insulation, so I can't use that. Yeah, and now it's time for one final uh, test, just without the test cartridge, just to see that uh, everything looks okay. And it does. So that's two down and eight to go in this series. So that's it for uh, this uh, video. Uh, this was actually a rather long one and as the title suggests this was kind of a wild goose chase. But when I saw that I was on the wrong path I followed that path uh, to the end to uh, yeah, learn a bit more on how the, the data bus on the C64 and uh, the address bus on the C64 actually works and the decoding scheme. And we ended up with uh, another almost fully socketed uh, C64, the um, 556 ship and the uh, 7474-ish flip-flop uh, on the clock circuit is uh, not socketed, everything else is socketed. So we will try to avoid that in uh, the next board. I have not decided yet which board uh, that should be, but I'm going to start uh, working on, uh, on that uh, probably later today, and we will see how that will work out. The next uh, video will probably be in a, a two weeks time from now, and that will also feature a C64 standalone board is not uh, a computer. Uh, I do have, as I've shown you before, several of these boards uh, laying around and I'm actually going to yeah, repair uh, most of what I have of C64 stuff, but I'm going to concentrate on the old bread bin boards uh, first and uh, take it from, uh, from there. And I hope you have learned something about how the internal workings of the Commodore 64 are during this uh, video and I hope you leave a comment on the video if you have some comments about my way of showing the schematics and try to explain uh, what I do with showing the pieces in the schematics as I go along. So hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit uh, like and subscribe, it will really help out the channel and it will also help you to be notified when I post my new video. So thank you for watching and until next time, see you then.